And uh, and this morning, the invocation will be offered by Pastor Rick Luster from the Church of Queen Valley. And then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance by Supervisor Goodman. Those wishing to participate, please stand. Thank you. Heavenly Father, as we uh, convene here, I've been asked to invoke your presence here. Thank you, Father, that this body still wants to do that. And as we think of this uh, day, December 7th, 81 years ago, the tragic events that unfolded that took the lives of 2,403 of our fellow citizens. And Father, um, this day, we should be reminded of our history While sadly we have people in positions to remind us of our history, they're wanting to rewrite it and they're wanting to push the reality out. But God, you are a God of truth and you are a God of reality. And for us now to know that you gave several warnings before this happened that could have changed the events that day, but they were ignored by the people that could have. And Lord, all through the scriptures, you reminded your people that they need to look at their history and take note. And so, Father, as our nation has decided to push you out of the classroom and to push you out of our community, and only a few places are left like this, a simple invocation to acknowledge you. We live with the consequences. Back, God, when the Ten Commandments were still in our school, my wife's parents graduated from Florence Union High School in 1952. The big problem was spit wads and chewing gum. And today, Lord, we live with the consequences of pushing you and your moral codes out of our society. And while we dealt with gum chewing, my grandson at 16 years old in Casa Grande Union High School is dealing with his 16-year-old girlfriend being murdered by her 21-year-old brother where he murdered the mom and the dad his girlfriend, and the five-year-old niece right over here a few months ago in Casa Grande. And, Father, very few are paying attention. The sheriff's department certainly does. They have to deal with it. But, Father, this comes as a consequence of us not recognizing the benefits of your blessings. And so, God, we ask for you to be merciful to our nation and that there would be more bodies like this that would take time to acknowledge you And realize the depth of evil that can be present in a human heart can only be deterred by not fearing what weather will be like in a 100 years, but by fearing you, God. You said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And sadly, wisdom has been lost from American society. Sometimes we call that common sense. It's been pushed out and replaced with man's ideas, seeding man as God. And when man is God, the evil that potentially lurks in the human heart, spreads like a cancer, and it's happening in our nation. So God, may this body be mindful that their decisions should be just and that they're going to answer to you for what they do. May your blessings be on this meeting. Give wisdom to these representatives that you've placed in positions that can look out for the welfare of the 455,500 residents of this county. We thank you, Father. You will hear when they lean on you. May you be present in this meeting, and may there be peace even in disagreements today. We ask it through the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. So, good morning and welcome to the Pinal County Board of Supervisors, December 7, 2022, regular meeting. We are in order. Uh, first, item number one is discussion regarding the 2022 Pinal elections, uh, the, follow- the handling and the follow-up by staff. Ms. Roll, you're up. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, Yesterday, the Secretary of State was out at the elections office in Coolidge. They completed their logic and accuracy test. We passed on all three machines. 
Uh, we started our recount yesterday afternoon. As you're aware, the recount was ordered. I think Mr. Volkman will probably address that. We will be providing updates daily to the Secretary of State about the number of ballots that we have completed each day. So you will be able to go to their website and see what our progress is through the number of ballots that we have. Um, and let's see. Um, the recount is uh, underway. I, what else did I have? I think that's it. So quick question, how long will the, you're doing the recount of the day of ballots presently? Yes, we started with election night ballots. Um, I expect to finish them probably by mid-morning tomorrow. And what I plan to do, because the hand count of the recount is only of election night ballots, I plan to start the hand count as soon as we are done with counting election night ballots. So I anticipate convening the hand count board. There are 12 members that have been appointed by the committee chairs, precinct committee chairs, uh, maybe as soon as Friday, so they can begin their hand count. Uh, they will choose randomly five precincts, and um, we will get going. It should, I, I wouldn't anticipate that it will take them more than a couple of days to complete that because they're only counting two races. So five precincts, is that more than the 2%? Because that seems like we did a couple last time. You, you have 2% during the general, during the hand count of the recount, it's 5%. Very good, thank you. And then, and then you do the, the uh, mail-in ballots also? We will be counting the early ballots as the hand count board is convened. But they do not, in the recount, the hand count of the recount does not include early ballots. That is not part of the statute. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Supervisor Surdy. Who are the, uh, is this county employees that are doing the recount? Is this folks that were involved with the other elections? No, we are, we are using staff. So I convened a tabulation board composed of staff and a couple of election cycle temps uh, to do tabulation board and duplication board. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Oh, uh, Supervisor Kavanaugh. And, we, and Supervisor Surdy just asked about the using employees. Why do we use employees rather than members of the community who are not employees? I will be candid with you. It cost about $300,000 to print the ballots for our election. The early board that counted for the general election cost us $47,000. If I use them again, it would cost us a third of the budget to count the ballots. Whereas if I use election cycle temps, they are all bipartisan members of, of parties. They're, um, it saves about $40,000. For the members of the public who may be concerned that here we have a government entity counting the ballots and, you know, it's, it's our, in our interest to make sure everything is straight and smooth and it might be a concern of the public that, that you know, our first priority is to, to make sure no errors are made or at least not revealed. And so that's a, that's a you know... A, I'm not agreeing with it. I'm saying that's a, an opinion that could be expressed. So should we consider, you know, uh, funding? We, f we fund lots of things, and uh, should we consider funding uh, for volunteers, or is it too late in the process, volunteers that are paid? The individuals who, are, who have taken the oath to serve on the tabulation board for the recount are not individuals that were involved in the count of the election. I believe that they do not have any vested or other interest in not ensuring that whatever they see is what they report. Uh, these are all being observed. It's all being live streamed, and we have observers who are present. So it's kind of difficult for them to hide anything or make anything up. Sure. And they were not a part of the process of the original count. They can only report what the machine tells them when they conduct their recount. If I, budget were not a factor, it, not a consideration, would you use volunteers rather than employees? No. 
Supervisor Goodman. Uh, and and to, to Supervisor Kavanaugh's point, I guess the question, the real question is, what kind of oversight is there in regards to the recount? How does that all work? So we, of course, have the political observers who are on the ground. Both parties? Both parties. Or all parties? Any, any, anybody's welcome. You know what? We haven't closed our door to anybody. Any member of the public is welcome to come in and observe. Uh, we've not shut anybody out. Do you have people come and actually observe, though? Yes, they're on the ground as we speak. Okay. So we have those independent observers who have the ability to ask questions if they don't understand what it is that is going on in the tabulation room. We've controlled the tabulation room. As you may have observed on election night, there were a lot of people and uh, a, lot of, a lot of activity. We really wanted to make sure that we kept track of everything in the best possible way with chain of custody and the number of people handling ballots so that there is no possibility of confusion. Uh, anyone is welcome, and they can spend as much time as they want there. Supervisor and, uh, Goodman? Yeah, and with that, because there are a lot of skepticism out there with individuals, uh, you know, personally, you've heard it here, that they're invited to come and observe and be a part of it. I think it would be an eye-opener for a lot of people if they actually took more interest on the observing side to actually see how these elections are ran from that position. You know, I was amazed that our Republican Party and how they rose to this particular case in here in our county and participated quite heavily along with our Democrats and really worked hard to straighten our election department up for this, for the general election. And I haven't heard, there's been a couple of inc incidences that were, you know, we're not a perfect society, we're not a perfect by any means, but this is the best system that really is out there. And I would recommend that people that are skeptical to come and observe and be a part of the process and actually see for yourself and witness it firsthand and on what's going forward. Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Goodman, to your point, you have all been in the Elections Department. It is a, it is a small environment and uh, fairly uh, informal to the extent that we can. Uh, and so you know that we are open to your questions, we're open to your observations. We, we would not, uh, we've, we've not said that We've not turned anybody away, and we welcome anybody who wants to, especially the public, not necessarily a political observer, but especially the public. Come in and take a peek, and we'll answer your questions, because you're going to look at the process, and you're going to ask questions. We had someone from the Carter Center yesterday, and she's like, what? I, I think you need to close caption the live streaming, because when we see the live streaming, we don't understand what it is you're doing. Well, come in, and we'll explain to you what we're doing. It's, it, it is a fairly simple process at the end of the day. We're going to take these boxes out. We're going to take the ballots out. We're going to put the ballots in, and they're going to be counted. And then the ballots are going to go back into the boxes and secured. It's going to happen over and over. It's the same process. But we welcome anybody to come in, and, and we're happy to answer questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board? Supervisor Kavanaugh. Just one fine. You said anyone's welcome except maybe not political observers. How do you differentiate? Oh, no. I, it's not. Anyone is welcome, not just political oh, observers. Oh, oh, I think it's not. Forgive me. I, that's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Roll. Mr. Volkmer, I, know, I could just hear you wanting to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Ken Volkman, Pinal County Attorney, uh, Chair, members of the board. Just real big picture. Um, elections are completely controlled by statutory, um, at the Arizona Revised Statute. We don't have any ability to choose what we want that's not a choose-your-own-adventure type of thing. Uh, Pinal County elections aren't different than Maricopa or Cochise or Santa Cruz or any other one. Um, and what happens, and this board is pretty familiar with it, but last week we came in, this board canvassed. The canvas is merely the ministerial duty saying, this is what our elections department um, gave us as the results. Each county, all 15 counties have in fact now 
um, canvassed. They sent all of those to the Secretary of State, and then there was another ministerial perfunctory duty that occurred yesterday morning, and that was the Secretary of State with both the Governor and the Attorney General's office present, as well as the Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court were present, while the Secretary of State then canvassed all of those 15 um, separate canvases. Uh, Once that happened, the Secretary of State's office filed a lawsuit, and they had to because statewide there were three races in Pinal County, there's only two, uh, that the margin a victory was narrow enough that a recount was mandatory. However, that can only happen if there's a lawsuit filed. So a lawsuit was filed. They filed it in the Maricopa Superior Court. It is CV 2022-015915. Uh, and essentially that judge gave very explicit directions and very explicit orders to each of the counties, um, really to the Board of Supervisors, but it, it goes through you to our elections department. Uh, Our elections department has been complying. That is what Ms. Roll came up and discussed with you today. Uh, There is one thing that I need to make very clear to both you and the public at large. There's effectively a gag order that is put in place. So Ms. Roll said she can let the the, um, Secretary of State know the total number of votes, but we can't give a daily vote total to the public. In fact, I'm going to read it verbatim. Um, So it says each of the counties, and then it says, shall not release to the public the results of the recount, including daily vote totals, until the court has certified the results. So I know that there has been a public request to say, hey, can you give us the update? Just let us know. I know some of you have heard that where constituents have said, hey, where are things at? We just want to make sure everything's good. We cannot provide that publicly. In fact, it would be a violation of a court order, and we would all be in a lot of trouble. Um, So unfortunately, we have to wait until the process is done. Uh, We have until December 21st to complete it. We believe it will be done sooner than that. Um, But until then, it's really kind of radio silence other than what we're providing to the Secretary of State's office. And with that, that's the only real update I have for the board. Very good. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Volkmer from the board? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Volkmer. All right. Moving right along. Call to the public. Uh, Those wishing to address the Uh, Pinal County Board of Supervisors need not request permission in advance. Action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter or rescheduling the matter for further consideration and a decision at a later time. And as a reminder, board members shall respond to criticism or ask the staff to study the matter or request uh, placement on a future agenda at the conclusion of the public comments. I have a few cards up here. Uh, First one would be Mr. McCain. Good morning, uh, Chairman McClure, supervisors, and staff, and friends. My name is Barry McCain. Happy uh, Pearl Harbor Day. Maybe we'll learn how to stop talking at each other, but with each other. We never deny history. The last election has proven that we must change our way of thinking in order to save democracy and the best part of democracy. For many decades, we've had what experts called either-or mentality. I believe this is not a healthy mindset, and I've described how uh, things have gone in the past. We have to change it now. And we have the legislature coming up, and I'm excited about that, not because we've got, new, we've got a lot of new people elected, but because we have to go in there with the mindset, what experts say, is that we need to, it's called, uh, we need more inclusiveness, not divisiveness. And that's what we've gotten in trouble. If we could talk with each other a little, maybe we won't go into any more wars. Not for a while, anyway. Uh, my, my cousin, U.S. Senator, the late U.S. Senator John McCain said that we've been spinning our wheels too many, on too many important issues because We've been trying to keep a way to win without help from the aisle. This is not going to help us, us being so divisive and everybody sitting up there saying, well, this is fraud. There's no fraud here. We're all American, and we got a good process, and we know that if we stick with this, everything will work out because we have to, we must deal with the world that we have, not the world we want. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, next would be Mr. Coward. Morning, Chair, Board. My name is Dave Coward. I live in Gold Canyon. Uh, cities across the valley are imposing new regulations on short-term rentals, which local lenders have blamed for diminishing housing affordability, noising part, nosy, noisy parties, and quiet residential neighborhoods. Those of, uh, of us in unincorporated areas of Pinal County are also facing these same problems. I personally live in an HOA community facing these issues. A new state law went into effect that allows cities and towns to require short-term rental licensing and revoke permits in a narrow set of circumstances. It's a limited return of regulatory power to municipalities, but local leaders have moved quickly to take full advantage. In six valley cities and towns, officials are at different stages of adopting these new regulations, but the major regulatory components are consistent across all six communities because of rigid guidelines in the state uh, law. Uh, and they are rental owners must get licensed with their city and pay a fee. And this will allow governments to effectively monitor and map the properties for, first, for the first time since 2016. Permits can be revoked if a court finds three separate violations occurred within a 12 month period. And this gives the local rules teeth that earlier state laws didn't have. Background checks are required for the guests to book the stay uh, to ensure they have not been convicted of a serious crime, including sex offenders. And sex offenders also can't operate a rental property. Property owners must notify nearby neighbors that they are running a short-term rental property and uh, provide a contact number for someone who can respond to residents' complaints 24-7. And a sales tax license and proof of liability insurance are required for local permitting. Since I live in an unincorporated area and rely on the county to act as a regulatory body for my community, I'm requesting that the county adopt similar regulatory measures to help protect homeowners within your jurisdiction. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next would be Mr. Sabin. Good morning, Supervisors, Mr. Chairman, uh, Pete Sabin, Unincorporated Marana. Um, I saw a meme recently that said, uh, I used to think Iran was a bad place until I saw scantily clad, clad men dressed as women twerking in front of little kids at a public out library story hour. Um, it's sick. Um, they were protected by snipers. Just weird. Um, anyway, um, God will judge people according to their actions, but... Leave children out of it. Um, Elon Musk's Twitter, uh, that expose now shows conclusively that our federal government, the Biden administration, has unconstitutionally suppressed the First Amendment rights of Americans by suppressing uh, dissent, any differing opinions on narratives regarding COVID and election theft. Um, it turns out that the FBI did, in fact, interfere with the 2020 election by suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop story, which shows that President Biden is uh, firmly in the pocket of the CCP. 10% for the big guy, right? Um, also, COVID, uh, Missouri v. Biden now, that case is going on. That's um, about this suppression with big tech collusion with the government. Um, that case, uh, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Mengele, he, uh, he actually admitted that he knew of no studies that showed that face masks were effective at preventing respiratory virus spread, which is why we haven't worn them during flu season because they don't do anything. He also admitted that they came up with the idea for lockdowns based on one man looking at China's response and thought that that would be a good idea to do lockdowns based on false data that China was putting out. So the last couple years of everything that we've gone through have been a complete lie. Um, and then, you know, here locally, uh, <clears throat> we've got Katie Hobbs, who just certified her own victory in a case where she also, she took FTX money, she took cartel money, and she certified her own election where 
she's also suppressed, and there's emails to prove this, using Twitter, suppressed people who opposed her. So she broke the law and suppressed people's First Amendment rights. And then she suppressed the vote by causing all these machine problems in Maricopa, in conservative areas only, where it turns out it was actually 50% of the voting locations, not just 30%. And then she coerced boards of supervisors by threatening them with felony charges if they didn't certify. So congratulations, Arizona. We now have a criminal communist dictator as governor-elect. I'll be praying for Sheriff Lamb and his deputies and all the victims of trafficking and fentanyl overdoses because they're sure to get worse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ravellis, you are up, sir. Roberto Ravellis, resident of Gold Canyon. Regardless of one's political affiliation, Mr. Chairman, it's fair to say that this has been one of the most consequential elections in our lifetime, an election characterized by competing beliefs regarding trust in the fundamental integrity of our nation's election process that pitted political and factual truth versus big lie fantasies. As the Republican leader of the U.S. Senate put it, the expected national red wave never materialized because of flawed Republican candidates and extremism they promoted here in Arizona and other swing states. In candor, I'm saddened Pinal County voters overwhelmingly voted for all election deniers, but grateful that our fellow Arizonans chose truth-telling by candidates for governor, for secretary of state, and for the election of Senator Mark Kelly, all of them candidates who unconditionally support the integrity of Arizona's elections and vigorously defend our nation's constitution. Unfortunately, we now likely face two more years of conflict from the defeated, twice impeached former president. Arizona's fa Arizonans facing pressure and divisiveness from a disgraced candidate under civil and criminal investigations that likely will result in legal indictments. On this day of infamy, recalling the sneak attack on our Navy fleet in Hawaii on December 7, 1941, we cannot ignore this past weekend's attack, a despicable attack on our nation's constitution. We're not witnessing a desperate candidate who in no uncertain terms attacked our nation by calling for termination of our Constitution in his unhinged demands for an illegal new election and a declaration that holds him as the winner of the last presidential election, despite our Constitution. Pity the unavoidable dilemma facing truthful Republicans who have sworn an oath to defend our Constitution against all foreign and domestic enemies. Clearly, all office holder Republicans, from precinct committee persons all the way up the party's hierarchy, face a fundamental challenge. Either continued loyalty to the irrational leader of your party or an equivocal public declaration of loyalty to our Constitution. Whether a constitutional sheriff or other county elected official you cannot, at the same time, be loyal to an enemy of our Constitution and loyal to your oath pledging allegiance to our Constitution. I look forward to joining others in promoting loyalty to our threatened Constitution and supporting a path back to genuine patriotism by all elected officials. Finally, we must not let any self-serving, unpatriotic politician promote distrust or attempt to steal our dignity and loyalty to the Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ravellis. Are there any others that wish to address the board? <clears throat> Sir, come, come on forward and please state your name and generally where you live. Uh, my name is Greg Mahoney and I live across the street from, um, this is in reference to the uh, consent item Z. Z, okay. Am I allowed to talk now? We're going to do Z in a little while. Okay. It'll be, it's going to be pulled. Thank you. Are there others that wish to address the board? 
Seeing none, we'll move on. Thank you. Uh, we have number three, purchasing division report. Ms. Peterson, I see you out there. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and members of the board. I'm T.R. Peterson, your purchasing manager for Pinal County, and this is your purchasing report for December 7th, 2022. First, the board is requested to approve the following contract amendments, RFP 170223 for inmate telephone services. We recommend approval of amendment number six to exercise the optional extension period from January 30th, 2023 through April 29th. 2023 with Securus Technologies, Inc., and this is used by the Pinal County Sheriff's Office. RFP 170322 for inmate tablet program. We recommend approval of amendment number five to exercise the optional extension period from December 20th, 2022 through April 29th, 2023 with Securus Technologies, Inc., and this contract is also used by the Pinal County Sheriff's Office. IFB 190324 for aggregate slurry in Portland cement. We recommend approval of amendment number four to exercise the optional extension period from August 21st, 2022 through August 20th, 2023 with the following suppliers. CMEX Construction Materials South LLC, Gila Rock Products, Hanson Aggregate LLC, and MDI Rock, and this contract is used by the Public Works Department. Next, the board is hereby notified of the following cooperative purchases made. PO number 248611 with Santan Ford in the amount of $218,491.96 for two 2023 F-250 4x4 Super Crew pickup trucks, and this will be used by the Sheriff's Department. PO number 248668 with High Tech Network and Security Solutions, LLC, in the amount of $151,802.51 for video hardware used by the Recorder's Office. PO number 248669 with Vanguard Truck Center of Phoenix in the amount of $228,952.69 for a new dump truck used by the Public Works Department. And lastly, the board is requested to approve the following cooperative purchases. Requisition number 166176 with Dance and Construction, LLC in the amount of $592,472 for demolition of the Pinal County Medical Building used by the Facilities Department. Requisition 166185 with Vanguard Truck Center of Phoenix in the amount of $347,332.12 for a new truck, also used by the Public Works Department. And Requisition 16202, or I'm sorry, 166202 with Velocity Truck Centers in the amount of $344,149.53 for a street sweeper used by the Public Works Department. And that concludes your purchasing division report for December 7th, 2022. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Any questions from the board? Seeing, hearing none, uh, I'd ask for a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the purchasing report as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. And I would just back up. Uh, Mr. Liu, back to the call of the public. I neglected to at, do something here. Uh, the short-term rental codes, can we look into those, please? Thank you. I wasn't reading my own notes. So. Oh, stop. Okay. Uh, let's see. Item number four has been withdrawn. Uh, item number five, presentation by Mr. Volkmer. <coughs> Acknowledging participants of the paint Pinal purple event. Good morning, Chair, members of the board, Ken Volkmer, Pinal County Attorney. Uh, today's a real kind of a privilege for me. Um, if this board remembers, about two months ago, uh, my victim services manager came in and asked this board, read the DV proclamation declaring October Domestic Violence Awareness Month. She read the proclamation and we asked this board to adopt for Pinal County um, October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Once the board did that, we then challenged our community and we reached out to our community and we challenged them to, to paint Pinal purple. Uh, it is something that our governor has done at the state capitol for a number of years and what we ask is various businesses and individuals to light up their house purple. Um, light up their business, their house purple, and keep it running purple for the entirety of the month. 
We do it for two reasons. One, uh, it's to bring awareness to it. Uh, again, just to, to give a real quick breakdown, last year we had 2,265 victims that came forward that my office prosecuted defendants for abusing them. Let me say that again, 2,265 victims. That's just here in Pinal County. In the state of Arizona, we had 98 domestic, uh, domestic violence-related deaths. Um, it is a scourge on our society, and we really want to bring awareness to it. We ask the public to help us, and then there's a second reason we ask them to light up uh, their houses and their businesses purple, and that is to show support to these victims. Because with that number of victims, there are neighbors, there are friends, there are loved ones, and we want them to know that they are loved, we want them to know that they are cared for, and that we as a community are here for them. Uh, what we're here today for is actually the three winners. So we had 11 different participants. This is the first time we've ever done it. Uh, my hope is that it's going to continue to expand. Uh, there were 11, so against abuse, uh, Arizona City Fire District, CASA, the City of Eloy, Durham School, First Arizona Title, Mental Heart Therapeutic Play, my office, juvenile probation, um, Pinal County Medical Forensics, and Alan Schalkowski um, all participated, and there were three winners. Um, I was the judge, jury, and executioner. They were all put up on a wall, and they just said, which ones do you like? I'm like, I like that one, I like that one, and I like that one. And all three of those are here today. What I'd like to do is uh, allow them to come up so we can introduce them, um, we can kind of show their appreciation, and I'm hoping the board will take just a quick break and take a photo with them because we do have a plaque and certificate to acknowledge them. Um, so, yes. So our, this is actually our, our grand prize winner, Alan Schalkowski. Um, Alan has been, um, he has been, uh, negative's not even the right word, his, his daughter was murdered um, in a domestic violence incident. And Alan has donated and volunteered his time. He's shown up at our events. He's actually sort of gave his testimony, given his story, so others can appreciate um, what's going on. And, and it's a very powerful touching movement. Uh, I know we bring law enforcement together and we have law enforcement um, listen to some of these things. And, and Alan is here today. Alan obviously lit, lit up his house. You can see little in the hearts. There's various pictures of his house. But uh, he is an absolute advocate for domestic violence awareness. And he was actually our number one winner. Again, it was a cold. I didn't know that it was Alan's house. It was just a number of properties. Um, we also have um, second place was actually our Pinal County Medical Forensics. So if we can go to the next picture there. Um, obviously, medical forensics is dealing with this on a regular basis, but what we did, what they did, is they actually highlighted the, interior, the interior of their business. So when people came in, they knew that they were supported, they knew that they were cared for, they knew that we were here to help. So again, I, I, you can only imagine somebody coming in for those services to be able to fill that level of support, I, I can only imagine. And then our third place was uh, Amanda Comage Troer, um, and she runs Mental Heart Children's Therapeutic Play and she lit up her business. So it's, again, it's a place where kids can come in and actually get that therapy. So what I'd like to do is, is if we can bring them up and, and kind of just give them a round of applause because they were the winner. They're our inaugural winners, and our hope is this is something that will continue and they'll continue so we can, as a community, continue to show our support. So if we could have all three please join me. I'm guessing they don't want to speak. If they want to, they're more than welcome. I'm seeing everybody put their heads down. So if the board would be so willing, if you'd be willing to come down and take a, a photo, I would, I would ask that we do, you would that. do that. You bet. Thank you, Chair.
very briefly in conclusion, board, thank you. Chair, members of the board, we appreciate it. We appreciate the support that you show us as a law enforcement community. We appreciate the support you show in, in all these proclamations. They do mean something. And, and most, most importantly, thank you. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to those that came here today. I, I think this is something that we need to continue to keep at the forefront of all of our minds. Just because there's one month where we acknowledge it, the 11 months out of the year, it still matters. Uh, and with that, thank you, board. No, it's a big deal. Thank you, Mr. Volpern. Okay, next is item six, county manager's report. Mr. Liu, you're on deck. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to let the public uh, be aware that a few of us were able to be privileged enough to see the progress in our Peralta Regional Park, which is the first of, of our kind here in the county. It's a 500-acre park up, uh, up at the Superstition Mountains. Um, as those that went can attest to the beauty of that area. They did a really nice job on the park. There's uh, hiking trails, <coughs> biking trails, equestrian. There's stargazing node. Uh, there's a cool bat cave. And so pretty soon, uh, Kevin and we'll work with Supervisor Surdy. We'll put a video out for promoting and for educating on what the park is, the do's and don'ts at the park. And it'll be open to the public on January 12th. Thank you. And the bat cave had that barricade that fell down in front of it. I noticed, you know. That's right. Car That's comes right. up. <laughs> Thermonuclear reactor is great. If you hit the secret button, yeah. then you'll see the Batmobile go in there. <laughs> okay. Um, is that all you've got, sir? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, item seven is consent. Uh, consent items. All items indicated by an asterisk will be handled by a single vote as part of the consent agenda unless a board member, county manager, or member of the public objects at the time the agenda item is called. I have... Um, I would like to pull item B. I have a request for pulling item AA, and I have a request to pull item Z. And I'm getting a nod that I did that right, so thank you so much. Are there any other items that the board would care to pull this time? Are there any items that county, somebody there, county manager wishes to pull? No? Members of the public? Very well. Uh, may I get a, may I get a uh, motion here? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve items A. How far are we going? AF. To AF minus B, Z, and AA. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Item B is uh, the discussion, approval, disapproval of the appointment of Mark Minor. Uh, he's from Florence from the build, uh, Building Board of Appeals Advisory Board. He is here today, and we thought we would give him a certificate, take a quick picture, and if you'd like to say anything. Sir, Mr. Minor. Mr. Chairman and Board, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to serve the county. My family and I relocated here from Maricopa uh, about a year ago for a lot of reasons that were touched on in the public comment, and we're very glad to be in a, in a supportive and, and county that stayed comparatively sane in the last couple of years. So hope to, to r return some amount of service, and Mr. Allen at the building department asked if I would consider the appointment, and so I'm pleased to be here today. Thank you for considering me. You bet. So we have a certificate for you and a picture. So stay, oh, stay there. We need to vote. What? We need to vote. You should oh, vote. Okay. Well, just stand, just stand there for a minute. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Good point. All right. So uh, can I get a motion, please? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number B. Thanks for keeping me in line. And, and a second, please. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Nothing like standing right in front and getting voted on, right? Okay, let's go take a quick picture with Mr. Minor.
alter ego stuff over just there. There we go. There we go. That's it. And in three, two, one. And again, in three, two, one. One more. Natasha, do you have do you have uh, calls for Z? Okay, I'm going to do that last. Then uh, let's move to double A. Uh, Mr. Avellis, you wanted this call, I believe. Roberto Ravellis, resident of Gold Canyon, Mr. Chairman, uh, I uh, w wish to express. A, a, approval of double A, but I'm also an advocate that public lands are for the use of the public. And so I think that one of the aspects that are shown in this agenda item is the need for education. I think as a resident of Gold Canyon area that is disturbed by OHV users going off designated areas. And I, I would strongly recommend that the county provide a map with depiction of the lands that are designated and permit OHV users. So with that, uh, I strongly urge support for an approval of AA. Thank you, Mr. Revelis. Can we, can we look into that type of thing? Thank you. So uh, item AA, may I get a motion, unless there's any other comments from anyone on this? Hearing, seeing none, make it a motion, please, on AA. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve item AA as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you very much. Item Z. Ms. Kennedy, you pulling up Mr. Estes? And then do you have some comment cards for me? Okay, uh, Mr. Mahoney, I believe you're up. And do we have do we have uh, Mr. Estes on the line? Okay, thank you. Yes, Chairman McClure, I'm, I'm on the line. Thank you, Mr. Mahoney. Um, hello, uh, my name is still Greg Mahoney. <laughs> still. <laughs> and I'm sorry for my uh, procedural uh, ignorance, but um, I live across the street from lot number 11. It's parcel number 30803. 0770, and it's been continuously occupied by Dan Dickinson and his girl since October 31st, 2020. It's well over two years ago. Well, uh, could I just ask where this is? This is in Oracle. In Oracle, okay, it's thank you. Right near the library. Okay, thank you. Um, to save time, I'll only speak about the events after there was granted a permanent mandatory injunction. It was issued by Judge O'Neill on April 4th, 2022. Uh, wherein it was ordered that the plaintiff, Pinal County, uh, be awarded judgment against Daniel Allen Dickinson, where Part A says all of the illegal vehicles and generators shall be removed from the property, and Part D says after the 30 calendar day compliance has elapsed, the plaintiff, plaintiff is authorized to remove and dispose of all prohibited items. Well, four days after that time elapsed, um, Dan Dickinson temporarily moved his trailer, but only for six months. And he moved all the generators, uh, items that were in the trailer, animals, and his girl into an old abandoned water tank that was existing on lot 11. Uh, it was never built to code for habitation, and it has no infrastructure uh, at all. 
Um, Dan arranged an illegal water hookup and many other illegal modifications in previous months. And um, two months later, Pinal County Code Compliance and Building Safety Officers inspect the outside and, uh, and place on this water tank a condemn notice. This was in July. And um, they witnessed Dan and his girl running into the water tank to hide, you know, with their dogs barking at the door. They wouldn't answer the door um, to talk to the officers. And during the second notice in August, a code officer talks to the girl who admits that she lives there. Um, I've witnessed her constant occupation of at first the trailer and then the water tank for over two years now. Um, in October 2022, the Pinal County attorney contacts Dan's attorney to request an inspection inside this condemned water tank. Uh, Dan apparently allows inspection in a month, and then Dan starts fixing lot 11 prior to the inspection by removing these phony property markers that he just put up, probably without a surveyor, and shoveling some of the dirt that he put outside his east boundary back inside his boundary. And I witnessed this on November 11th. Now, just before the inspection, on November 15th, Dan moves his trailer from Lot 11 again. He had just moved it back to Lot 11 10 days before, after it was gone for six months only. Um, the girl and the dogs leave before the inspection, and from my yard, I witnessed Dan mow the front grass, rake the tire tracks off the driveway, and trim the front bushes until code compliance officer and um, building safety officers arrive to do a, a quick inspection. I go inside, and an hour later, all Dan's truck and trailer stuff, the girl and the dogs are all back on lot 11 again. And um, all these kind of activities uh, from these people are only necessary, you know, for Dan and his accomplices' chosen way of criminal life. Uh, their addiction to endlessly chasing shortcuts to the material good life has created stress and anxiety for many others in this area, this neighborhood, who have managed, you know, to achieve most of what they want from life with luck and decades of work. Um, Dan has had over two years to comply. Uh, he has continuously ignored the county's opportunities by lying, cheating, and demanding special treatment, not equal treatment with other people in this neighborhood. And his vindictive behavior against this county and this neighborhood should incur penalties well beyond his, I think, $700 total fines for two years of continuous violations. Um, if respect for the rule of law is ignored out of convenience or the inability of multiple departments to actively cooperate allows criminals to proliferate, it will be to the detriment of our society as a whole and to our community's future. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mahoney. <coughs> Are there questions from the board? Comments? Any other people that wish to speak to this? Oh. <coughs> Gary? Yes, good morning, uh, Chairman McClure, Vice Chair, 30 members of the uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, Darren Gary with the uh, <coughs> County Attorney's Office, Deputy County Attorney. And um, my name is associated with this item, so I wanted to stand to see if there are any questions that the board might have. Essentially, we are asking for authority today to enforce the building officials a condemnation order uh, in conjunction with other violations on the property. The county takes this issue very seriously. It is a health and safety issue, and to underscore how important that is, we do have our building official, Mr. Allen, here today, as well as the involved code compliance officer, uh, Heather Wright, and our code compliance manager, Paula Mullenix. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to address those. And this has gone on for at least a couple of years that I can recall. It has, and there, there was a, a prior lawsuit, and there was a judgment associated with that lawsuit directly focused on a trailer that was on the property and generators that were powering that trailer. Uh, when the property owner moved into the structure, now the focus of this lawsuit is on the structure uh, that has been condemned and the importance of removing any occupants who are residing in that structure unlawfully. Very good. Any comments, questions from the board from Mr. Geary? Hearing, seeing none. Make it a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to uh, approve item Z as presented. 
of a motion for item C. Is there a second? I second that. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Moving right along, item number eight. Uh, number eight and nine will be discussed together. This is the discussion, uh, approval, disapproval of ordinance number 2022-PZ-042-21, ordinance approving case PZ-042-21. Ham Papago LLC, Harry's Island, landowner and CVL consultants. And Mr. Evangelopoulos, you are up, sir. <coughs> Board of Supervisors, Mr. Chairman, good morning. My name is Evan Evangelopoulos, and I will be discussing today uh, case PZ04221 and PZPD04221. It's in the, in the Maricopa area. And... Uh, it's a requesting, it's two cases, a rezoning and a planned area development. It is an old case, uh, an old PAD from 2006. It was originally zoned um, CR3 and CB1. And right now the applicant is requesting a rezoning to R7 PAD <clears throat> to allow 544 single family lots. The site is uh, very close southwest of the Akchen Pinal Indian community. And the applicant is uh, CVL Consultants, Julie Vermillion, and the owner is Ham Papago, LLC. So the previously approved PAD proposes 502 lots. The current PAD proposes 544 lots. <coughs> This is the approximate location of the project. This is the area on Papago Street and Green Road. These are the cases. Currently is a fallow land. There was an abandoned building, a pad, a concrete pad at the corner. And there is a small commercial area in the corner and um, CR three single residence zone as was rezoned back in 2006. And it's proposed, uh, it was proposed under cases PD 023, 06 and PZ 023, 06. The total area is 158.25 acres the proposed zoning is R7 PAD. This is a comment, you've seen this slide before in the previous presentation. This is a continuance case. This, is, uh, this presents the available commercial areas in the area. And this is the proposed development plans. It has six access points. And open space configurations that are higher than the previous plan. This is the site data. Um, the open space is uh, about 18% right now. And um, for this a comparison with the previous plan, previous plan, had a density of 3.5, this plan has a lower density of 3.44 acre developing units per acre. This is looking north across Papago Road. This is a small cattle farm right across the street. This is looking south. And this is looking uh, east, southeast, uh, along the east boundary. This is a present uh, swale. I don't want to call it a ditch. It's a drainage channel. This is looking 
on the on this on Green Road along the west side of the property. It's all fallow land right now. This looking east, you can see Papago Road running along there. This looking west, I don't, I'm not sure what the name of those mountains are. This is across Green Road. So these are items for the Board of Supervisors consideration. The submitted applications for this land use request are for approval of a rezoning and a PAD. If it's approved, the subject property will be rezoned from CB1 and CR3 to R7 pad, and it will allow a development of 544 lots on almost 158 acres of land. Today, one official letter in opposition has been received, but other residents have spoken out uh, fears about traffic density and loss of rural lifestyle. And the loss of rural lifestyle is the one that was emphasized the most by the nearby residents. The property has legal access. It complies with the density of the Pinal County Comprehensive Plan. And uh, of course, granting the rezoning and the PAD will require after the time of approval that the applicant owner submit and secure from the applicable and appropriate federal, state, county, and local regulatory agencies all required applications, plans, permits, supporting documentation, and approvals. And is requested approval of the rezoning with one stipulation and of the PAD with six stipulations. One more thing to add that was not included in, in the packet. At the time the packet was being prepared, we received a letter from Maricopa, from, from the city of Maricopa, that um, objected to the, to the plan on consideration that the Maricopa, it's part of the Maricopa general plan. And there, the Maricopa general plan requires a density of up to eight development units per acre a much higher density of mixed use and multifamily. And so based on that, they're objecting to the single family. And I will submit this letter with the clerk. Did, you just said that Maricopa, the city of Maricopa wants it as eight units per yes, acre? Yes, that's the, it's up to eight units. Yeah, so that, because that's their planning area, but they yes. don't have control of it at this time. No, they don't, it. yeah. But it's up to... Up to up to eight, yes. Up to eight. Up to eight, yes. That's they don't mix. close anything under eight. They just they just say that their planning area. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Oh, please go ahead. Uh, they would allow up to eight. Yes, for mixed use. For mixed use. Yes, which could include multifamily um, developments can, and so can on. Can I ask another question, Mr. Please, Chairman? Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> just real quick, because. Uh, when this piece of property, was it not what we call one of those zombie subdivisions that had actually been formed like in the 80s or something? 2006, it was approved, yes, right before the recession. The first time it was, because I thought it was older than that. Maybe you're correct. I'm not, I'm not sure of the history before t 2006. It might have been, 2006 might have been an, an amendment of an older one. But in 2006, it was approved with uh, 502 single family units. I understood it went back farther. Could be. Uh, could be. Well, I'd like to know the answer to that question because I, I remember or what I thought was attached to this particular project was it, it was an old, old plat from way back. It's kind of, kind of set dormant for a long time and then has been resurrected around 2006. Okay. I can. But I'd like to confirm that. I can find the information for you. Very well. Are there other questions from the board on this item for Mr. Evangelopoulos? Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay. Um, hearing, seeing none. Uh, the applicant uh, presenters here, uh, Mitchell Willard. Well, not really. You don't look like Mitchell. <laughs> I guess I need to sign in. 
Um, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the board, happy holidays. Carolyn Oberholzer, back before you on this case. Um, still with Bergen Frank Smalley and Oberholzer, 4343 East Camelback. And I am here be, um, for you on behalf of LGI Homes, just the clarification in the staff report again. It's still reflecting the prior ownership, and LGI Homes did um, close on the full 160 acres of this property back in August. Um, so since uh, last month, and, and thank you, Evan, again for the presentation, um, I know we had a very robust conversation about commercial and what's the appropriate amount of commercial in this area. So we took this time in this intervening period to do a deeper dive into that analysis and look at what is not just um, you know, in the study area, which was seven miles, but what's right around the property. And, oh, am I too close? Time's up. I blew it up. <laughs> I remember I did this last time. You didn't see the light time. flash? It was in. Stop, you're too loud. <laughs> No? Okay, sorry. There you go. Um, so what we did is we looked at what is it right in the area. And if, if you go just one mile north and two miles south, so not even a full two-mile radius, within just that area between Papago and Green and the one mile north and then two miles south along 347, not including this property, there are 180 acres of commercially zoned land both in CB1, in CB2, in C3, and CI1 categories. So all of varying levels of intensity, all more intense than the 15 acres that we are seeking to rezone to residential. And so when you look at that intensity of commercial uses, we actually came away with, the, we really do need these rooftops to support that commercial. Now, I just learned about the city of Maricopa's letter um, that Evan pulled me out and showed it to me. And when I looked at the letter, the city of Maricopa says, and they cite the um, Pinal County Comprehensive Plan saying that the general plans for the incorporated areas of the county should govern development of those areas. This is not such area. This is miles outside of the city of Maricopa's in cur current incorporated boundary and south of the Ak Chin. And so were we in an annexation possibility with the city of Maricopa, then they are, they're asking in that letter also that developments within their planning area should seek to annex. We, we don't have any contiguous boundary. We're miles away from having one, and not to mention in the middle is an Akchin Indian Reservation. So I don't know that there's any likelihood that this property could annex into Maricopa without many additional annexations coming around the west side and coming to us. So it is not unusual um, in cases in counties, I certainly see this in Maricopa County, where there is a general plan that applies to a larger planning area, and that differs from whatever the county's comprehensive plan says. But your comprehensive plan absolutely governs this property. It designates it as the residential category. And this plan, as I mentioned to you guys last month, the limit in your comprehensive plan, you do have a limit. You could not approve a zoning category above three and a half units to the acre without a comprehensive plan amendment. So in, your, in conformance with your, comp your plan, this application is conforming and we're actually reducing the density by a little bit to even be below that. Um, to the question about the old subdivision, I don't have any knowledge of that because this is um, two parcels. So it is not a recorded plat. There may have been an approved tentative plat at some point, but um, it, it, at least from the parcel history, it's just, uh, it has not been subdivided. So I'm not sure which one that was. Um, so uh, with that, we are um, hopeful that uh, we have the support of the board to move forward. As I think I mentioned last time, we do have a tentative plat that is um, on file with the county right now. They are ready to move forward um, and hopefully move into development in 2023. The LGI team is here, Rick Tarian and other members of our team. And on behalf of us all, um, thank you for the time you've spent on this. We'd be happy to answer any questions. And if there's any additional questions that come up during the public, I'd be happy to have that opportunity to return to the podium. Are there any questions for Ms. Ober Oberholzer? Uh, Supervisor Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At issue with this uh, development is that 15 acres. And so um, 
the, the citizens desire that that would be preserved, but what is the likelihood, you know, from your expertise or experience, that that would be um, leased by a restaurant or some other th thing? Can you speak to that? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the board, Supervisor Kavanaugh, the the 15 acre parcel um, is zoned CB1. That's the lowest intensity. Uh, use. And if you're going to have uses like restaurants, they typically want to be drawn to an anchor tenant. They're looking for larger centers because they call it an anchor tenant for a reason. They they need the other draw and the other reasons for people to go there. And so the un, it would be very unlikely that this would develop on its own for a, a restaurant use or anything else, certainly not before there are thousands of residences around it to support it. And because there is so much commercial available several miles up the road in Maricopa, and also several miles to the west of where we are right now. There is a commercial center just outside of Thunderbird Farms that has available commercial development still. And so for that to all come to fruition, in addition to the 181 other acres, um, the likelihood is with a residential project like this, the, what it would do is if it were left to be open as the 15 acres, it, it wouldn't likely ever materialize, and, and that's also borne out by the economic studies projecting out based on the densities here, what kind of commercial development would be, there would be demand for. In that study, we were talking about like 90 plus acres of commercial land over 35 years within this trade area. And when we're talking about having 181 just close by, that this 15 acres would capture that is unlikely, um, especially because it has that lowest intensity of development. So it's not likely, in terms of the commercial uses, it's not likely to draw an anchor. So um, with that, we would be left with a residential development where you know people buy homes knowing that there's a, a, an empty lot next to them and LGI would retain it, but um, it would be hard to, to sell those last homes because people like to know what's going to be next to them. And so we could complete this development. And again, we, we did increase the open space. So it, it is not as though it's a, you know, pack all the homes into that 15 acres. We got seven acres of additional open space um, into the plan when we included that. So I hope that answers your question. You. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Oberholzer. This, this uh, item, 8 and 9, have a, a public hearing piece to it. And at this time, I have three folks wishing to speak. I will start with Ms. Davis. I have copies of my statement. Thank you very much. And if you would please just state your name and generally where you live, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. My name is... My name is Robin Davis. I live on Warren Road in the South Hidden Valley area of Maricopa. I'm here today to ask the board to reject the proposed amendment from commercial to R7 on the Venita Project, PZ04221 and PZPD04221. When you look at the nice graphics that, uh, that the lawyer and the developer have displayed, they, they proclaim that there are many other commercial sites available to the surrounding area. But if you grant them this zoning amendment request, then it sets precedence. Then you must grant every other developer their request to turn all those other commercial areas that were on the display that were circled into residential areas. So poor planning will effectively eliminate all possible proposed commercial sites in this area if you allow this one developer their request. We feel that 15 acres of commercial space will benefit the residents of Thunderbird Farms and Hidden Valley in the long run. It might provide small office spaces for home businesses that are growing. It might provide a veterinary clinic or a feed store, maybe a small restaurant or even a laundromat, which right now there are none in the Maricopa or Stanfield area, and we have to drive into Casa Grande. There's plenty of room in this 15 acres that could provide much needed space for commercial businesses to the area. It would be foolish to eliminate that now before there is even a chance for it to grow. At least some small amount of commercial space could benefit the residents, current and future. We don't like the development out there, but we understand that it's coming. What we don't need is 42 more homes and 84 more cars. We see what's happening in Maricopa and that it's not working. 
the developers seem to ignore our requests and just do as they wish. It's all about more homes and more money. Always follow the money. It is not acceptable to anyone because we feel that nobody is listening to the residents and refuse to mitigate with this. Then I ask you this. Leave the 15 acres commercial while they develop the site. Well, under development for the two years upon completion, hire a commercial real estate developer to see what they can do with the site. If after two years they cannot get any businesses interested in being there, then they can convert the commercial to residential. But there must be accountability so they do not sit on the property and let time run out. I'm hoping that the board can work with us for the best possible solution for this 15 acres that pleases everyone. We love our rural way of life, but feel the squeeze of city people coming in and taking it over. We'd at least like to have something that benefits us. The developers don't seem to care to work with us and don't care what we think. In conclusion, I ask the board this. When do you stop Arizona from being paved over and allowing unlimited houses to be built before you run out all agriculture, farming, and open space, which will destroy the natural beauty that Arizona has to offer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up would be Mr. Leppard. Good morning. Let me, uh, this will be fairly quick because you've seen some of this, but I want to hit the major points so hopefully they have a chance to sink in and recurring themes that we've been working on probably for the last couple of months with various uh, uh, local uh, authorities. Let me get you your, your uh, presentation first. Uh, who am I? I'm Ken Lepper from Thunderbird Farms, Hidden Valley area. Anything else, Natasha? Okay, thank you. All right, the top phrase just says, look, we're setting some standards here, and some of which seem to be discounted from time to time. It's the water, the roads, the quality of life, and the environment. So WRQE is a uh, call sign. First of all, short slide that shows what a long report said. We currently have the ADWR over two years ago saying, we've got these certificates and designated water supplies. We are short over 9 million uh, acres of uh, cub uh, acre, acres of, uh, of water. So the idea being that we already know there's a shortage of water. Nobody knows when that hits. I will tell you that there are wells in our area, south of our community, which have already run dry. And water is being trucked in, uh, and their water was taken over by other commercial interests like Global Water. If you go to the next slide, please. What can you do with 15 acres? I saw this slide at the last PNZ meeting that I attended by one of the major developers in Arizona. And they pointed out that with 15 acres, with all due respect to, uh, to Carolyn, you can do quite a bit. Small acre with inline suites and multiple pads. Typical users include culture, financial institutions, fuel station, retail shops, and restaurants. Our area currently has a single restaurant and they do okay, but you go building all those homes, there won't be a restaurant around there to serve any of those people unless they drive into Maricopa, which is at a minimum a 25 mile round trip. And again, these aren't my, this is not my slide, it's made by a major developer who's looking for it. The other thing that I, question that I would ask, and I didn't take time because it just occurred to me, there are several acreage, uh, commercial acreage areas along uh, Maricopa, Papago Road there, those, in fact, look like they're smaller than the 15 acres that we're currently under discussion. So if they're smaller and they ought to stay, it's kind of like a catch-22. Those guys we ought to consider, but ours is too, too small and it may be bigger. Quality of life and environment. Talk about the Community Development Department and the ideas is that we are worried, we pay attention to the quality of life for everyone in an area. And the big question is that I'll, we'll continue to ask, who's watching out for the rights and quality of life for rural residents and businesses? We've got to grow food. We've got to get things done. Let's please move forward with that. 
Let me run real quick to the others. The environment on the property has been fallow for years. There are protected species there, probably. That needs to be explored and studied. One more set of comments. One more quickly. Yes, sir. So there are summary and recommendations. The community remains opposed to high density, as already stated. Quality and flooding of roads is serious issues. There are traffic lights that they've currently got in the PAD at Green Road and the uh, north-south cross connector. We think that needs to be removed. It just slows down, slows down uh, uh, traffic. And there's an increased traffic, light pollution, and noise. Retain commercial acreage for the benefit of both Trisana, Vanita, and the general area. Deny the request to rezone. Require a full environmental impact study. We're not opposed to the product. We're opposed and appreciate the deeper backyards, but density remains a top issue. And don't forget the water supply. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lutter. Thank you for your time. Uh, let's see. Next would be uh, Ms. Flanagan. Mary Eileen Flanagan, and I live in Hidden Valley. Chairman McClure, Vice Chairman Surdy, Supervisors Kavanaugh, Goodwin, and Goodman, and Miller. I am addressing you about today's agenda items number eight and nine. The question of whether the Vanita subdivision near Hidden Valley, south of the city of Maricopa, should be allowed to do away with their originally zoned commercial district and put in roughly 50 more homes. I am opposed to this zoning change for the following reasons. First, as stated before, it sets a dangerous precedent. If you give one development permission to replace commercial housing with more houses, you may well end up experiencing pressure to do so for larger commercial areas and other subdivisions. And there are several other large developments slated or already under construction on this flank of our neighborhood. Second, while this commercial area may not be well suited for a QT or a fast food restaurant, what is to keep other developers from using the same tactic of choosing poor locations for their commercial areas in the hopes that they may be able to later change them to houses? The 15 acres under consideration is certainly large enough for small offices, a feed and tax store, a daycare, or some other enterprise that this area will sorely need when there are about 5,000 more souls living on the edge of our now rural community. Next is the tax base question. Commercial tax rates are usually much higher than residential tax rates. Why should the county give up a potentially higher stream of revenue, especially when that revenue means more jobs in Pinell County and a greater chance of people not commuting to other counties to spend their money? As more people work in Pinell County, more people will want to shop here, have their medical appointments here, and otherwise keep their dollars here. All this will greatly benefit our future certainly more than 50 or so more homes would. And there's the question of schools. More homes probably means more children sitting in classrooms. Our schools are already bulging at the seams, and we already have a teacher shortage. Why add to those issues by granting more homes? For those reasons and many more, which I'm sure you will have heard today, such as eventual widening of the 347 through another reservation, I'm asking you to vote no on ordinance number 2022-PZ-042 and 41-21, which is your agenda items eight and nine today. Thank you for your time and consideration of these concerns. Thank you, Ms. Lanning. Are there any comments or questions from the board at this point? Supervisor Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for Ms. Olberholzer. <clears throat> Do you know the history of this 15 acres, how, how it became designated? Um, so, Mr. Chairman and Supervisors, uh, just according to the zoning history, in 2006, it was rezoned, and it included a commercial, a CB1 commercial corner, as was the practice back then, we say. Um, it, common planning was to have commercial corners at every hard uh, arterial intersection. There have been a lot of change dynamics in the commercial market and the need for space that are a, a permanent shift in terms of the role of the internet 
And so there has been a movement that has really taken hold over the last 10 years to right-size commercial, to make sure we don't have too many sites competing with one another, and to have you have a better understanding now of the relationship between rooftops that drive the demand for retail. And if the rooftops aren't there, the retail will never materialize. And so the history, as I look back into the file, I wasn't a part of it, is simply that if you look around, all, not just Pinal County, Maricopa County, and all the cities within it, the conventional wisdom was you plan commercial at these corners. But again, it, there's been a, quite a change in both the market and with the internet and then the pandemic that have just fundamentally altered the way that we, we do that now. And um, routinely across the valley, we are processing cases very much like this, where the retailers demand that they need more residential. So you have a lot of cases um, that are going from commercial to residential. But every time there is this scrutiny of, is this the right location? Do we have enough other opportunities here? And what are the dynamics around it? And with the ak -Chin Indian community right there, where there isn't likely to be a proliferation of residential development, the 180 acres that I mentioned as being within two miles of this, just on that stretch, is entirely within Pinal County. None of that, Pinal County being not ak -Chin, none of that factors in what is uh, existing on Akchin and, and likely to expand on Akchin in terms of commercial. But we, what we know we don't have there is a lot of rooftops coming. So this area is also constrained from because of that separation of, of critical population that to support the commercial, that um, you know, this is a key candidate site for becoming a part of this community, which again, is it's only 160 acres. This is not a huge project in terms of the projects you see here. And so this um, community will be able to function intimately uh, the way it's been designed and we will be building out the adjacent roads and we'll not have the scallop if the corner stays commercial and vacant, we'll have all those scalloped edges and this can be one complete corner that will be a very attractive entrance to this area and not vacant for uh, potentially many decades and forever. And earlier you said you would, did you say you increase the um, open space or you could increase the open space? We did increase. So when um, the project was originally approved in 2006, it came with a minimum open space percentage of 15%. We had increased it in the PAD application that's been before you and considered is the 18%. And so when I, when I spoke about that seven acres um, in response to some of the comments about we're just packing a bunch of homes in there, I wanted to also say, well, we're adding homes, but we're also adding seven acres. Almost half of the acreage that was uh, CB1 is being folded in, and, and the community is able to spread out around that 18% open space. So if we approve the, if the elimination of the commercial space, could you add any more open space? Uh, in, the, in the project design, yes. Do you have any estimation of what that would be? Well, when we looked at the design, um, we could go up to 20% open space, and that would equate to about two more acres of open space within the project. Again, this is not on the corner. This is taken into the, the large open space system. Okay. So we could increase the minimum open space for the project for the PAD, so that would be item uh, 9, we could uh, add a stipulation for 20% open space if that's the board's pleasure. Any other comments from the board? Supervisor Miller. Would that, uh, a quick question to that. Would that re if you went to 20% open space, does that reduce the number of lots or will it just tighten up the lots that you have? Um, or do you know? Mr. Chairman and board members, so as I mentioned, we had a tentative plat that's in process, so we already have a nice buffer. The tentative plat that we submitted actually has more than the 18%. Now, we're not in final design yet, so we hesitate to get too close to our minimums. We, we do overplan them, but we have looked at it, and we, will, we can comfortably accommodate 20%. Okay. And I apologize. I confuse this project with another project because I know there are some zombie <laughs> projects out there. 
So well, you know this. You know these uh, old projects well, so I, I, know, I was questioning. Yeah, I'm just, trying to, just trying to remember all of them. But, okay. Uh, I, if I just may oh, go ahead. rise for a second, you know, it's it, uh, the use of this land is all market driven. If there was a need for com for commercial, I can tell you the commercial community would be out there gobbling it up. <laughs> They would want it just as much. The, and this, and to the old design of a commercial corner or commercial strip along a subdivision was very prevalent in the early 2000s, saw it all the time. But with the internet and the, you know, the stick and brick mom and pop shops are, are, are gone. I mean, it's just a handful of these corporates that tend to, to be able to, um, uh, you know, utilize their their marketing ability to to draw in and so um, and this all can change I mean I don't know I mean in 15 years you might not have all the lots sold someone comes in and they want to clear some lots out and make a commercial strip in there I it might happen I mean it can happen this and so um, the, as far as the water I can tell you that the water is uh, is not an issue if you've received a letter of um, uh, a, a serve to serve a will serve letter from Global Water. They've calculated in the amount of water you're going to need, and they've got it to be able to deliver it. Uh, the nine million acre feet of shortage is over a hundred years, and it's actually I've been working with some modeling, and doesn't seem to be that high necessarily. Actually, it's been kind of uh, stabilized, but again, those calculations are already in it that, that that global water would use up all their designation, and they haven't. They've got tons of designation they haven't used, so they'll deliver. Uh, if you know, if the, if the subdivision gets a will serve letter from global, they'll get water. I mean, and they won't run out of water for a hundred years. So, I just think some of this stuff is, is projected as potential things that might happen we don't know what's going to happen and I and so I I tend to go towards the property rights of uh, the people that are purchasing the land and what they want to do with it um, um, the, the urban lifestyle versus the rural lifestyle is a conflict and will be a conflict and will continue to be a conflict uh, until people quit moving to Arizona I think and I don't know that that's going to happen anytime soon so, um, uh, anyway, those, I know those are kind of editorial statements, but uh, if there's a possibility of 20% uh, um, open space, that's very generous in, in the big planning, in the big scheme of planning. Um, that's a pretty good compromise. That's my opinion. Are there any other, thank you for your opinion. <laughs> are there any other comments from the board? Questions? Any other comments from the public? this time you've already spoken mr. leper um, any other comments that have not from the public that have not spoken <laughs> seeing none hearing none, I'll close the public hearing and we I would ask for um, a motion on item 8 please mr. chair I'll make a motion that we approve item number 8 as presented Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval unanimously eight to zero with one, one, one stipulation. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Uh, moving along, I would go to item number nine. Uh, may I get a motion on item nine, please? Mr. Chairman, I would move that we approve item nine with six stipulations check that seven stipulations including um, expanding the open space to 20 percent right. I have a motion is there a second I'll second that motion and a second those in favor aye aye, aye. opposed hearing none motion passes thank you 
Okay. Item 10, discussion, approval, disapproval of the First Amendment to lease agreement between Pinal County, a political subdivision of the State of Arizona, the Lessor and Oracle Fire District, the Lessee, for certain real property and improvements. Mr. Ortiz. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, Board of Supervisors. Uh, Joe Ortiz, Pinal County Public Works, uh, Deputy Director. Um, item 10 is a request from Oracle <laughs> Fire District Department to amend a current lease between Pinal County and the Oracle Fire District. Um, this is for real property and for improvements to extend around a current helipad that's out there. This helipad is adjacent to our Public Works Oracle Yard, maintenance yard. Uh, currently there's one helipad there. They'd like to expand to have an, a secondary one there. Uh, we reviewed it. Uh, there's no major issues from the public work side or real property. Um, and I believe there's concurrence with PCSO on wanting this as well. Um, so with that, uh, staff is recommending the approval. Um, just as a footnote to this, uh, this agenda item does require uh, unanimous uh, approval by the board. Okay. Are there questions from the board? Supervisor Cavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would Chief uh, Thomas like to explain why this is necessary? I think it was for the heliport that we're putting in. We're going to have the commercial flights. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> Chairman, Supervisor Kavanaugh, Chief Deputy Matt Thomas from the Sheriff's Office. Uh, just for that area, the helipad is going to be useful for our our helicopters and for the landing of medical helicopters as well. As you know, uh, like with our deputy that got shot this year, that was one of the issues was getting a helicopter in close by. So uh, any helipads in that area are going to be helpful because it's somewhat remote. And is there was there something for, that from the FAA had an issue with dust or something? That, that, that I don't know. I, Uh, I don't know if they had technically issues, but they had concerns because of the existing helipad. There's just one there. I think in the past we did, there's a parking lot for the administrative building there that was sometimes used, and they kind of frowned on on that. Okay. So, the, the parking lot being dirt? Or uh, it's it's a gravel chip seal. So but it kicked yeah. it up? Yeah, right. This would mitigate that issue? Correct. Okay. You're good. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, make it a motion, please, then, from for item 10. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number 10 as presented. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Item 11, but Mr. Th Matt, Chief Thomas, don't go away. <coughs> Okay, item 11, approval, disappro discussion, approval, disapproval of, of uh, Pinal County Sheriff's Office to request and modify the wage and salary administration for detention officers. Ms. Shepard, you're up. Chairman McClure, members of the board, Mary Ellen Shepard, Deputy County Manager. As you're aware, recruiting qualified candidates to fill our vacant detention officer positions to staff the adult detention center is a ongoing challenge. To help address this critical staffing issue, we're wanting to modify the detention officer step plan to allow lateral hires to be credited on a year-for-year -year basis for each full year of verified credited experience with another agency. Currently, lateral hires receive half credit for each full year, placing them at a lower step on the step plan. In other words, they are paid lower than their peers with PCSO for equal experience. The change being proposed allows us to offer a fair competitive wage, making it financially possible for individuals who want to join the Pinal County Sheriff's Office and Pinal County because of our reputation and culture to be able to do so. 
We implemented the year-for-year -year lateral credit for Sheriff's Office deputies approximately a year or so ago, and it has been highly successful in recruiting qualified candidates. The Sheriff's Office has the budget capacity to fund this change. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Seeing and hearing none. Got lucky. Okay. <laughs> so have, so uh, let's see here. So in item 11, uh, make it a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number, item number 11 as presented. Second. Without even asking, a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Shepard. Thank you, Chief Thomas. Thank you, Board. Item 12, discussion, approval, disapproval of membership in the Canada Arizona Business Council, CABC, relevant performance goals expected for membership, and all this stuff up on the screen. So, Mr. Smith, are you around? James Smith. Oh, Smithy. Yeah. Who's Jimmy? <laughs> I'll go ahead and introduce us if that's okay. Would you like to do that? You want to be Mr. Smith? <laughs> I'll be Mr. Smith for a moment. Uh, yeah, uh, and Glenn had come and, and presented um, uh, to us in a previous meeting, and then uh, Supervisor Surdy, uh, Supervisor Miller, and myself were able to attend uh, one of their quarterly meetings uh, last week um, and got to see the network, uh, the education, and uh, the awareness and benefits of, of the council from that perspective. Um, so this item before you is for to approve a membership um, to the Canadian Arizona Business Council and to uh, do the relevant budget amendment to, uh, to pay for that membership. Um, we do think that there should be some just level of reporting back as to the activities of the council um, and results and things that we've seen from our membership. And Mr. Smith is, is walking up. So um, if there are any other comments or questions, though, that, that's the gist of it. Um, but Glenn is here. Um, and, uh, and James is now here, and I'm no longer Mr. Smith, no longer. Uh, but we, we can answer your questions as a team if wanted. Mr. Smith, did you have anything to say? You just showed up for fun. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, go ahead. But I, no, I was just going to ask ahead. if we could get a report from our two supervisors that it did attend that meeting. Okay. Yep. Would you have something to say? Yeah, when you first uh, start talking about this organization, you don't realize just how involved Canada is in this area in Arizona and uh, how much they love Arizona and how much they invest here. And almost every mine in Arizona is is owned by the Canadians and and uh, Circle K's and a lot of a lot of banking. So how does that play in is we, we want Arizona to thrive and to be prosperous and have jobs. And I think with their continued investment, then, uh, then that keeps that going. Why would it be important for us to belong to this group is because we would have connect, connections to these players, whereas we might be competing against other states. And if we have a closer connection to these Canadian businesses, then I think it, it might well land us some more jobs here that we might otherwise lose to just competing states like Utah or Texas or wherever. And uh, so, so that's what I, th I think. And for this contribution, I mean, if we land one, one project every five years, it more than pays for itself. So uh, that, that's my thoughts on the whole project. Supervisor yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll add on a little bit there. Um, and I agree with everything Supervisor Surdy just said. But I think one of the things that came out of the meeting on uh, this last week that we came to was how, um, uh, how focused they are on technology and uh, kind of a, a more advanced type of uh, industries and how to, to improve on transportation, how to improve in all types of industry. And they... They have um, not your normal. I think they have access to uh, investors that are willing to invest into projects, not your normal with the bank type of scenario where you have 
people that will come with uh, real money, big money, that to participate in programs. And I, I, I was very impressed with the, uh, the uh, I guess, technology-type projects that they uh, produced. I think there's a better word than that, but I want to use that for now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and they are, they, are, they are invested here in Arizona in a big way already. They, um, they love mining, <laughs> and, which I think is a great thing, and Arizona is a great place to mine particularly for copper, and so uh, they're not going to go away. And so things that happen within our county, uh, I want them to know that we're part of the, the team and, and can uh, help advance the ball. It's been mentioned that there's a return on investment here. What is the investment? 10000 annual membership. Which, okay. So as Supervisor Surdy says, we landed one every five years. I mean, $50,000 investment would be quite a return. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, make it a motion, please, if there's no other questions from the board. We do that. Oh, can, I'm sorry. Can I ask that if we do approve this, uh, since the, the main uh, person is in the audience, if we could get perhaps a, a report, maybe biannually, on what's going on and just keep us apprised, because not everybody can go to those, to those meetings. So if you could come here and... Uh, and, and brief us on things that are coming down the pike, that would be very useful if we do approve it. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Supervisor Kavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Liu, would you assert that the benefits, the direct benefits that will flow to Pinell County from this contract uh, will be s substantial, and, and would you recommend approving this? Uh, I believe so. I do recommend approval. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Seeing, hearing none. Make it a motion, please. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item number 12 as presented. Have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Thank you very much. Motion passes. Item 13, discussion of board members' request for future agenda items and or reports to be presented at upcoming meetings. Are there any items or reports that the board would care to hear in the future? Supervisor Cavanaugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, from our um, Human Resources Department, a report of turnover in both our uh, our departments that are overseen by the our management team as well as other elected uh, departments, and so we can better gauge um, and, and inform our decisions like the decision we made today. I think uh, quarterly, biannually, whatever is... Uh, What would ever be most fruitful and 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 not per overburden the staff? So just making sure that we're doing what we we should be doing to well, well, that, well, the turnover is the turnover, and um, you know the vacancies are a concern. Okay. Are there other items or reports that the board would care to hear? At this time, seeing none, I would say okay, we can do that. And at this time, we're adjourned. <laughs>